Okay, good evening all. I welcome everyone to the Kerala PG discussion on dental urinary system in connection with, in association with Genomed. And uh, this month, actually, we are discussing cases uh, related to dental urinary system. And today is the day of case presentation. So the residents will be presenting cases. And uh, in this context, I welcome uh, Dr. Gomadhyay Subramaniam, President Kerala IRA, Dr. Rijo Matthew, Secretary Kerala IRA, and Dr. Demesh Shanai, Program Coordinator. And today our faculty is Dr. Sneha. She is Aston Browser in Sign Hospital, Mumbai. Hearty welcome, Dr. Uh, Sneha. Thank and you, sir. Yeah, uh, and also the coordinator, today's coordinator, Dr. Avani. She is consultant radiologist in Astro Medicity, uh, sorry, Astro Mims, Astro Mims, Kotakel. And also welcome the residents. Thank you, sir. And now, thank you, Dr. Avani, for introducing the speaker. For introducing the faculty. So. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. So, uh, yet again, we are in an academic session and we have a very brilliant uh, panelist today with us, a very, uh, what do you call, renowned speaker, Dr. Sneha A. Kinney. Uh, she has got her MD and DNB and she, has, uh, she was a gold medalist in her MD. She has done her visiting fellowship in abdominal radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, Boston, USA. And presently, she's working as an assistant professor at Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College and General Hospital, Sion Hospital in uh, Mumbai. Her areas of interest include abdominal radiology, neuroimaging, breast imaging, and fetal imaging. And she has more than 20 publications to her credit at uh, national and in, uh, in the national and international index journals. She has had multiple presentations at international conferences like RSNA and ECR, and she has won many uh, awards for the same also. And she has her two residents for this uh, particular session, Dr. Sayali and Dr. Anuja. So I welcome all of them for the session. I thank Dr. Sneha for accepting our invitation for doing it. And I welcome the residents for the session. Over to you, Dr. Sneha. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dr. Apni. And uh, without any further delay, uh, we'll start with the session today. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sneha Kinney. And today we'll be discussing a few interesting and important cases of genital urinary system, uh, keeping in mind the um, or some exam-oriented cases, basically, with some exam-oriented discussion. So let us start with the first case. This is for Dr. Anuja. So uh, this was a 78-year-old lady who presented with dysuria and frank hematuria since seven days. Uh, she was referred to our department and an ultrasonography was done. So these are the ultrasound images. Uh, so Anuja, can you just uh, describe these ultrasound images, what you're seeing in this? Yes, ma'am. The urinary bladder is distended with an heterogeneously, uh, polypoidal heterogeneously hypoechoic uh, lesion showing uh, internal vascularity. Uh, this is a likely suggestion of a neoplastic etiology, urinary bladder, uh, yeah. urinary bladder, see. Very good. So uh, we are, so this is a transabdominal scan of the pelvis, a transfer scan, which is showing irregular polypoidal mixed echogenicity, intravesical lesion or a mass along the posterior bladder wall or the bladder base, more towards the right side. Okay, so, and this is a color Doppler image which shows intense internal vascularity. So now based on the location of the lesion, involvement of what structure or what area are you worried about? Uh, it is uh, involving right to the side uh, junction. 
so you you will be worried about the psychoirritability Psycho yeah so now let us see the other ultrasound images yeah so these are the uh, other ultrasound images can you please describe them for me um uh, the right ureter is uh, dilated and uh, there is uh, involvement of uh, distal ureter okay and uh, what are you seeing here uh, the uh, right kidney uh, shows uh, hyd uh, hydronephrosis and with thinning of co cortex there is paper thinning of the renal cortex okay very good so uh, now as you said this lesion is the so this is a parasagittal uh, section and uh, you're seeing this the lesion of the bladder is seen involving the right vasoeuretric junction now there what is happening to the uh, ureter it is dilated so there is hydroureter but now ureter is a uh, contains urine so it's a fluid filled structure so it should appear anechoic but are you seeing something here what is this in the ureter there is a, uh, we can appreciate the endoluminal uh, growth of the lesion uh, and the uh, peri uh, periuretric fat stranding uh, okay so yeah you are, so we are seeing this urothelial thickening you can see there is thickening of the wall of the ureter and there is this hypoechoic lesion which is seen within the distal ureter okay so as you said there is a uh, involvement of right uj with urothelial thickening in distal ureter and there is hydroureter and there is long segment hypoechoic lesion in the distal right ureter and the right kidney is small in size with severe hydronephrosis and parenchymal thinning okay uh, so now the patient underwent a ct urography in our department and i'll be showing you images first and then you start describing the images so that people who are attending the viewers will get a complete overall idea of the lead, of the uh, case okay so just i'll just go through the images okay so this is and i'll show you relevant images so this um, is the ct okay okay so now anuja please describe what you're seeing in this yes the urinary bladder is distended and shows uh, and moderately and heterogeneously enhancing uh, polypoidal soft tissue density endovesical uh, lesion arising from the base and posterior wall of the urinary bladder uh, and it is uh, it is seen closely to, to the neck uh, there is perivesical fat stranding and it is seen in close approximation to the uh, right uh, vasico ureteric junction okay there is circumferential enhancing uh, urothelial thickening of the uh, visualized part of the ureter very good and the uh, mild endoluminal enhancing soft tissue is also seen in the uh, right ureter okay so and this is just the magnified image so uh, now this is the posterior bladder wall now can you see this bulge here what is this Uh, this is a uh, it you, it is uh, extra serosal spread and so perivesical spread of the lesion yeah so as you said uh, so there is this so you described it uh, correctly it's a polypoidal uh, intravesical uh, lesion along the base of the posterior wall of the bladder more towards the right side and it is seen involving the right vasico ureteric junction and uh, the important part here is you have to look at the perivesical extension of the lesion so in this magnified image you can see that the lesion is seen extending beyond the bladder wall so there is perivesical extension of the lesion now the, these are coronal uh, plane and uh, post contrast images so what do you see in this uh, anuja um the lesion is uh, ab abutting the uh, uh, right obturator internus muscle mm -hmm. okay so uh, so this is the ureter okay huh. the right lower ureter and this is the ureter this is the right so, ureter ha huh. so it what is, are you seeing in the ureter it is dilated and uh, shows uh, periuretric fat stranding with uh, urothelial thickening also the distal uh, ureter shows endoluminal uh, growth okay yes so there is you are right there is hydroureter and uh, there is this urothelial enhancing urothelial thickening and there is a, a hypodense 
enhancing lesion within the distal ureter okay and what is happening here what is happening to the right kidney uh, now there is atrophy of the right kidney uh, with uh, moderate to gross hydro uh, hydro ureter nephrosis with paper thinning of the renal cortical parenchyma oh very good so uh, based on this what do you, what is your diagnosis anuja uh, my diagnosis is uh, neoplastic etiology of the bladder wall uh, with the right mesenteric junction involvement and the uh, uh, with resultant right hydro ureter nephrosis okay and what about the ureteric lesion uh, it is involving the uh, there is synchronous distal right ureteric malignancy okay very good so overall then what do you think what type of malignancy do you are you suspecting in this that uh, transition cell carcinoma is the common okay uh, okay fine so yeah so this is a malignant neoplasm of the urinary bladder with synchronous lesion in the right lower ureter and most likely a urothelial or a transitional cell carcinoma so uh, why do you, why did you say that it is most likely a tcc or a urothelial carcinoma um, so the, uh, the urothelium is a transitional cell and uh, okay so this is the most common uh, primary malignancy of urinary tract okay and it usually presents an older age group with a male predilection we thought of tcc in this case because it because tcc tends to be multicentric with synchronous and metachronous bladder and upper urinary tract tumor okay now uh, what uh, do you know about uh, staging of urinary bladder anuja yes uh, ma'am staging of urinary bladder uh, malignancy do you know Yes, it is TNM stage, man. Okay. Uh, the TA is a, a non-invasive papillary carcinoma. Mm -hmm. uh, TA is a carcinoma in situ. Mm -hmm. uh, T1 invades subepithelial connective tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, T2 is muscular invasion, mm -hmm. uh, in which T2A is inner half involvement and T2B is outer out half involvement. Uh, T3 invades perivasical tissues. T3A is microscopic and T3B is microscopic and T4 is invades adjacent organs and pelvic abdominal wall. T4A is prostate uterus vagina and T4B is pelvic or abdominal masses. And uh, N is uh, regional lymph node involvement. N0 is no nodal metastasis. N1 is single regional lymph node metastasis in the true pelvis like involvement of perivesical, obturator, internal and external ILAC or sacral lymph nodes. And, and N2 is multiple regional lymph node metastasis, N3 is common iliac lymph node metastasis, and then M is distant metastasis. Very good. So on imaging, like uh, when you are doing a CT scan, uh, what is the primary thing that you're looking at in T staging? Like, can you make out whether uh, the which layers of the urinary bladder wall are involved or what are you looking at? Uh, Ma'am, there is uh, CT, there is main limitation of the uh, CT that it cannot differentiate the uh, layers of the bladder. Okay, very good. So uh, mainly you are looking at what? Ly uh, lymph node uh, involvement is mainly look in the CT and other complications like hydroureter nephrosis. Okay, and what about the T? You are looking at perivesical extension, right? Yes, whether it is T2 or T3, whether it has extended beyond the bladder wall or not. So if CT cannot make out, is there any other imaging modality in which you can actually make out whether it is uh, uh, like better, whether it has invaded or not? Uh, yes, MR is useful for... Yeah. Okay, so MR uh, can uh, show the bladder wall uh, better and hence it can uh, uh, determine the T staging better. Yes, yes, okay, yes. yeah. Uh, now, which are, do you know which are the other bladder cancers uh, uh, other than TCC? Any other bladder cancers you know? Yes, ma'am. Stamus cell carcinoma and uh, adenocarcinoma. Okay. Uh, these are rare. And uh, other like leomyosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma. Okay. And other non epithelial tumors like leomyoma, fibroma. Okay, very good. Uh, what are the uh, any specific uh, conditions in which you see uh, adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma of bladder? Uh, like in chronic stasis or inflammation, we see squamous cell carcinoma. Very good. And in 
diverticular formation due to chronic inflammation because of urinary stasis uh, we get uh, squamous cell carcinoma very good okay and uh, so even schistosomiasis uh, is thought to be a yes, predisposing yes. factor for a squamous cell carcinoma yes. of the bladder. Yes, yes. And uh, what about in the uracal remnants? What do you get in uracal remnants? The adenocarcinoma. Yeah, you get you uh, mostly get adenocarcinoma in uracal remnants. Okay. And uh, uh, where uh, will you expect metastasis from urinary bladder, distant meds, which are the common areas of distant metastasis from urinary bladder cancer? Um, in the uh, adjacent organs in prostate uterus vagina and lymph nodes is obturator and external iliac. No, distant metastasis. Lung metastasis. Lung, lung, lung metastasis. Liver and bone. These yeah. are the common sites of. So, whenever you describe any lesion in a scan, uh, you have to say negative uh, uh, points also that you're not seeing any uh, distant metastasis or, uh, you know, all these organs are normal or the vitalized bones are normal. Okay. Fine. And, uh, okay. So, now uh, shall we go to the second case? I think this is again Anuja's case. Uh, this was a 66-year-old male who presented with urinary retention since two days and backache since one month. The patient um, had, an, uh, had his ultrasound done outside from an outside center and was referred to our tertiary uh, care center for a MRI. His PSA levels were significantly raised, 104 nanogram per ml. Okay. So I'll again show the images first. And uh, so that the viewers can get a, a overall idea, and then Anuja, you can describe these images. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now this is the uh, multi-parametric MRI of prostate. So can you start, Anuja? What are you seeing in this? So on the prostate is a diffusely enlarged in site uh, with loss of normal zonal anatomy and shape with heterogeneously enhancing lesion appearing T1 iso intense and T2 heterogeneously hypo intense involving entire prostate. It shows a uh, restricted diffusion with corresponding low ADC. Uh, can you, uh, yeah, so this, uh, the contrast images are not really seen here. So T1, T2 and diffusion. So what kind of uh, diffusion do we use in prostate? And the high B value diffusion. Yeah, so uh, what is the B value that is used in your center? 800. No, what is the B value, high B value diffusion? 1400. Yeah, 100. more than 1400 we use, but we use 2000 in our center, okay? Uh, yeah, what, do, what are you seeing here? Uh, there is extra prostatic extension uh, into seminal vesicles. Okay. Uh, the posteriorly, uh, it is uh, abutting uh, rectum with um, uh, maintained fat plane. Uh, superiorly, it is invading the bladder base. Uh, there is a heterogeneously enhancing lymph nodal mass uh, on the right side of the lesion which is abutting the uh, right lateral bladder wall. Uh, the uh, lymph nodal mass is along the external and internal iliac vessels. Okay, uh, fine. So uh, these are just T2 images, okay? No contrast, contrast images are coming ahead. Okay, yeah, you've described everything well. So in this, you, as you, as Anuja said, we are seeing invasion of bilateral seminal vesicles here. Okay, there is invasion of the bladder, frank invasion of the bladder with intravesical component of the mass here. Then there are multiple nodal metastases as Anuja described. Or only thing, there are also inguinal nodes, obturator nodes, external internal iliac nodes, extensive lymph node metastases. Okay. Now, what uh, these, this is DCE MRI, that is dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, in which what are you seeing, Anuja? Uh, the lesion showing heterogeneous uh, contrast enhancement. Okay. Uh, the lymph node mass is uh, along uh, external and internal iliac vessel. However, uh, they show normal contrast opacification. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, heterogeneous enhancement is important. What is important in a prostate uh, 
uh, cancer is early enhancement okay so it is now this is a frank large uh, prosthetic mass but when there are small lesions where you have to decide whether um, you know uh, whether it is a dc positive or not then you have to see whether it, there is early enhancement on dc mri or not okay now then uh, what are you seeing in these images so these are t1 weighted images and t2 fat sat images yeah can you uh, what do you think these are uh, the t1 hyperintense and uh, t2 uh, hyperintense region are uh, scattered across bilateral iliac blades uh, uh, these are uh, likely suggestive of uh, um, metastasis from prostatic malignancy okay uh, yeah so most likely metastasis and because we are seeing now this is a post contrast uh, t1 fat sat uh, sequence mm -hmm. and coronal images so what are you seeing what is happening to those lesions uh, on con these are heterogeneous show heterogeneous contrast enhancement okay. also it is involving the sacral vertebra hmm. yes it's involving sacrum and so all pelvic bones are involved and what yes. are the femur oh. yeah so bilateral femur okay and uh, yeah so these are osseous metastases now uh, this is t2 fat sat abdominal screening sequence what are you seeing in this anuja uh, there are multiple lymph nodes uh, along a pre para aortic aortic aval region and it is uh, suggestive of distant metastasis the uh, abdominal lymphadenopathy okay and what are and the lumbar uh, the lumbar uh, lumbar vertebrae also affected and it also suggest of uh, metastasis yes osseous metastasis yes. so retroperitoneal nodal metastasis and vertebral metastasis so overall what is your diagnosis is the advanced uh, carcinoma of prostate with uh, lymph nodal metastasis extra prostatic and lymph nodal uh, metastasis the the pirates file region okay so as you said there's a prostate malignancy with invasion of bilateral seminal vesicles and urinary bladder with nodal metastasis and osseous metastasis okay so now uh, prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men and the fifth leading cause of cancer deaths in men H hence it is very important to know about all these imaging modalities that are required or uh, or the imaging protocol required when you get patients with raised psa values now can you tell me something about psa uh, anuja uh, it is prostate specific antigen man the free free psa and total psa Mm -hmm. uh, the PSA levels are, are normally four nanogram per ml. Uh, when we get a raised PSA, uh, they, this is an indication for MRI uh, with uh, clinically correlated with the symptoms. And the PSA value uh, divided by uh, prostate volume gives PSA density. Very good. Uh, the uh, PSA density more than 0.2 is uh, uh, highly suspicious for malignancy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, as I said, so PSA basically is a age. Uh, the normal values are usually age dependent. As you said, more than sixty years of age, more than four uh, nanogram per ml is considered abnormal. But four to ten is considered borderline, and more than ten is definitely abnormal. Okay, there are some benign conditions in which you can get a borderline raised PSA, and then these PSA parameters are used. PSA parameters like PSA velocity, PSA density, free PSA, all these contribute in evaluating the patient. Now there is a multi. Um, uh, so basically, uh, this PSA has to be correlated with clinical symptoms as well as clinical evaluation, like uh, the digital uh, rectal examination, and uh, then. Uh, we go ahead with imaging okay so what do you mean by multi parametric mri anuja um, so uh, what do you uh, yeah what what does multi parametric mri comprise of what is the protocol that we use yes uh, we give uh, we take a t1 uh, axial images for prostate uh, t1 images are basically to rule out the post biopsy uh, hemorrhage then we get uh, T2-weighted fast pinico sequences in three planes. Uh, 
axial coronal and uh, sagittal in axial images uh, is important for zonal anatomy and the uh, coronal and uh, sagittal images uh, to look for uh, extension of the uh, lesion then uh, we take uh, diffusion uh, images uh, the diffu uh, diffusion uh, for uh, it shows uh, diffusion uh, restriction with corresponding low adc in malignancy and uh, if necessary uh, we take contrast enhanced images uh, okay so basically multiparametric mr combines anatomical imaging as well as functional and physiologic evaluation okay so in anatomical imaging you take t1 and t2 weighted small fov uh, high resolution images uh, and uh, diffusion which is a high b value diffusion uh, sequence and dynamic contrast enhanced mri okay so dc mri so this overall is called as a multiparametric mri for the prostate okay uh, spectroscopy was initially used however the new pyrads actually does not include spectroscopy in it however it may be is may be used and can be used in few uh, is still used in few centers uh, now uh, can you tell me something about what is pyrads anuja yes ma'am it is a, a prostate uh, we take pyrads in peripheral uh, zone and a transitional zone uh, the uh, pyrads uh, one is uh, de de depend on uh, peripheral zone the uh, diffusion images uh, are okay, important just tell me what do we uh, what all just what sequences we evaluate for which so which is the dominant sequence for which zone yes ma'am uh, diffusion uh, sequences are for peripheral zone and for transitional zone we take uh, titubated images Okay, and uh, what is pyrads? Can you tell me the full form? What is pyrads? Uh, prostatic imaging. Uh, okay, it's reporting and data system. Okay, yes. so basically, data. as there is pyrads in breast, there is pyrads in prostate. There is prostate imaging, reporting, and data system. Okay, so basically, uh, how many points uh, do we give? Like, what is the point scale from one to? Okay, uh, one is uh, DWA and ADC normal, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, two are uh, in this uh, DW and ADC are indistinctly hypo hypo intense. Three is um, ADC focally uh, focal mild hypo intense, uh, and DW is ISO or mild hyper intense. Uh, in in three, if dynamic uh, uh, in contrast examination, if it shows enhancement, we label it as four, and if it does not show any enhancement, we label as pyrates three. Uh, in pyrates four. ADC is uh, markedly hypo intense and DWI is markedly hyper intense. Uh, phi, pyrates phi is similar to pyrates 4, but the size of the lesion is more than 1.5 centimeter or it shows definite uh, extra prostatic extension. Okay, so basically, uh, uh, what is uh, saying is uh, the dominant sequence for a peripheral zone lesion is a diffusion weighted sequence, while a dominant sequence for a transitional zone lesion is a T2 weighted sequence. Okay, so we grade or give a score the lesion uh, based on these sequences in uh, depending on the location of the lesion and how the lesion is behaving on these dominant sequences. Okay, so once we get a score on these sequences, then we decide that what is the pyrates category of that lesion. Okay, and uh, any kind of uh, extra prostatic spread directly puts the lesion into pyrates 5. Okay. Pyrates 4 and 5 are considered as abnormal. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, as we saw, MR is excellent in local staging of the disease and it impacts the patient management. And what are the common metastases uh, from prostate? Where does it commonly metastasize and what is the type of metastasis from prostate? Uh, it uh... Mainly bone metastasis mom, to the uh, vertebra uh, through bats and plexus, like hematogenous spread. Okay, yeah. So the commonest metastasis from prostate are to the bones. Okay. And then later it may go to lung or uh, or like other, uh, but the commonest 90% of the metastasis from prostate are to the bones. Okay. Okay. Uh, good, Anuja. Now we. Uh, uh, start with case three and Sai, this is your case. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, this is a 38-year-old male who presented with right-sided flank pain and low-grade fever since one month. Okay. 
so again, uh, as I, uh, so yeah, so our ultrasonography was done. And what are you seeing in this uh, uh, patient? Uh, I can see the uh, hypoechoic calysis. Uh, Uh, dilatation of the uh, upper ureter mm. and uh, uh, there is thinning of the renal parenchyma. Okay. However, the renal medulla uh, appears normal. Mm. Okay, we are mm. not really seeing uh, the med. So basically, uh, Sally, this uh, these are so the renal parenchyma is actually replaced by hypo to anechoic areas here. Okay, so this is the sinus fat here. Okay, and these are the hypo uh, echoic and few and with few anechoic areas within the entire renal parenchyma is replaced. Okay, this is the upper ureter which is showing this urothelial thickening up to the low the entire ureter up to the urinary bladder, and there is retraction and thickening of the urinary bladder wall at the VUJ. Okay. So now let's go to the CT. The CT urography was done. I'll show the images first and then you describe as Anuja did. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Fine. So now uh, yes, let's start discussing uh, the case. Sally, uh, what are you seeing? Can you tell me what images are these? Coronal MIP images, ma'am. Uh, first image shows the irregular calcifications in the parenchyma. Mm -hmm. uh, second image on the right side shows a suboptimal nephrogram mm -hmm. with a few hypo uh, sorry, hypodense areas within. Mm -hmm. There is extensive perinephric fat stranding with thickening of lateral conal fascia. Okay, very good. Uh, so as you said, areas of calcification uh, are noted in the right renal parenchyma actually. Okay. And uh, this again, the right renal parenchyma is replaced by multiple hypodense areas representing areas of caseous necrosis actually. Now here, again, you're seeing these actual images. What are you seeing in this? Um, hypodense areas uh, in the renal parenchyma, likely caseous necrosis mm. with uh, perinephric fat stranding. Yes. And few necrotic uh, lymph nodes are seen in the paraotic and pre-cable regions. Okay. Yes. So as you said, there is extensive. So the right renal parenchyma again is replaced by multiple hypodense areas. And there is extensive perinephric fat stranding. And this is thickening of the renal fascia. And you correctly said there are enlarged nodes at the renal hilum, pre cable and aorto cable regions. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Now, uh, what are you seeing here? Uh, there is extensive urothelial thickening involving the entire ureter. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, and uh, what uh, peri ureteric is... fat stranding, and uh, it is uh, extending up to the VUJ, uh, up to the bladder. Yes, yeah. uh, so can you see the uh, so this is you can see the ureteric lumen. So, can you see the lumen here? Oh, uh, no, ma'am, no, so there is narrowing here, okay, and then there is so there is as you correctly said, there is a scarred and narrowed pelvis and there is this enhancing urothelial thickening in the renal pelvis and the entire ureter with periuretric fat standing. You see, there is extensive periuretric fat standing. And as you can see the lumen of the ureter here, but you're not seeing ureteric lumen here, there is narrowing of the uh, ureter here. So there is kind of a stricturous narrowing of the ureter. Okay? Yes, ma'am. And what are you seeing here? Uh, there is a flattening and retraction of a posterior lateral bladder wall uh, at probably at VUJ. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, you are right. So there is flattening here and there is retraction of the bladder wall and there is thickening 
uh, of the uj fine so now overall ha uh, yeah and there is another what are you seeing here uh, so these uh, are delayed x uh, volume rendered image and uh, x ray trace coronal map images mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is no excretion of contrast uh, seen through the right kidney yes okay so if these are delayed images uh, uh, even the uh, taken later the, there was no uh, excretion of contrast from the right kidney even on delayed images okay so overall based on this what is your diagnosis uh, my likely, uh, likely diagnosis is uh, genital uh, sorry uh, tuberculosis okay uh, so why why are you saying that it is uh, tuberculosis um, because of the uh, pattern like uh, calcifications mm -hmm. areas of caseous necrosis mm -hmm. uh, strictures narrowing of ureter with urethral thickening mm -hmm. and involvement of the bladder okay okay fine yeah so i agree with you so this is a case of tuberculosis okay so what are the uh, patterns of involvement of kidney in tuberculosis that you know of uh it uh, it can show like pap uh, papillary ulcers mm -hmm. like smudging smudged papilla with mm -hmm. moth written calyces okay uh, then cavernous form is there with which which we see as in uh, caseous necrosis okay we can also see hydronephrosis pyonephrosis mm -hmm. uh then tuberculous perinephric abscesses mm -hmm. then putti kidney and miliary tubercles uh, in the kidney okay so what will happen if that caseous uh, area or the case uh, the hypotense uh, like the caseous uh, necrotic area or abscess ruptures into the calyces uh it uh, will lead to pyonephrosis okay oh, yeah so basically uh, there is cavity formation and that cavity co communicates with the uh, uh, with the calyx okay and uh, then the infection spreads into the urinary tract so what uh, uh, what uh, pattern of involvement will you get in urinary tract involvement with tuberculosis uh, in ureter first uh, we'll see uh, ureter or tony basically ureter is dilated mm -hmm. the next stage we see long segment strictures narrowing of the ureter then uh, we get beaded appearance of the ureter and then we can get a, a pipe stem ureter if urinary bladder is involved that bladder capacity is uh, there is a decreased capacity of bladder with thimble bladder also there might be involvement of the vuj that will lead to vur ah uh, vur okay so basically uh, as you said it starts with it can start with papillary necrosis okay then it can uh, uh, lead to caseous cavities in uh, the renal parenchyma which can communicate with the uh, calyces either inside into the pelvic calyces system or it can rupture outside forming perinephric abscesses okay it can combine or coalesce together to form a large renal abscess also which can actually mimic other uh, types of renal abscesses there is a pseudo tumor appearance also of uh, uh, renal tuberculosis you can get all kinds of calcifications into the in the renal parenchyma when it starts healing uh, when now this pattern of uh, involvement that we saw in our case okay so these are areas of caseation okay then the, this is called lobar caseation um, so uh, now Uh, do you know what is a bare paw sign and where do you get it chali oh yeah what's a bare paw sign oh okay uh, have you heard of xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis yes ma'am okay so what do you what uh, imaging appearances do you get in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis uh we see a stagon calculus mm -hmm. uh then uh, we get a mass a mass like uh, as okay uh, 
Okay, so you basically get multiple uh, hypodense areas like this, you know, calicial uh, dilatations, which give a multi-loculated appearance and it can mimic this pattern of caseation in renal tuberculosis. So that is a close differential of renal tuberculosis. But how do you differentiate this from xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis? What do you, as you said, what is the first point you said in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis? You get tagon calculus. Tagon calculus. So it is postulated to be due to uh, recurrent infections caused by obstruction. Okay. And it's like okay. a chronic pyelonephritis. And uh, how often do you see ureteric involvement as we saw in our case of tuberculosis in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis? Do you get? Uh, no, not really, ma'am. Yeah, not really. So you don't really get ureteric involvement. So what we saw in our case, okay? So very rarely, very few case reports, but however, it's not uh, uh, not seen usually in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. While in renal tuberculosis, uh, while in tuberculosis, you can get renal ureteric and bladder involvement with all the patterns, okay? You can get scarred pelvis with hiked up pelvis, as they say, on, uh, uh, okay, high, where you can get infundibular stenosis with caliectasis. Now, these are the sequelae or, you know, when the, when the, it starts healing with fibrosis, okay, it leads to narrowing at uh, multiple sites. So, it can either get narrowed at the infundibulum where you get infundibular stenosis and caliectasis. It can get narrowed at the PUJ, which can lead to hydronephrosis. You can get narrowings at the, in the ureters, which can lead to ureteric strictures as an R case okay so there is yes, this, uh, this is the entire there are like multiple um, patterns in which renal tuberculosis can present okay now um uh yeah okay fine and uh okay so now let's go to the uh, next case uh this is a 50 year old lady who presented with hematuria since one week no history of trauma, okay? Now, uh, again, I'll be showing you uh, the images first to get an overall picture and then you start describing, okay? Okay. So let's start. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, so, what are you last, seeing? Yes, the last, what images are these? Defined, coronal images and coronal actual what? misplain. Huh. Uh, yeah. CT, CT. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, so you start describing that way. Whenever in exam, you start what images are you given? Okay. So yeah, what are these images and what do you see in these images? Coronal actual or uh, CT images. Hmm. Uh, uh, I can see a large, well-defined, heterogeneous, hyper to uh, isodense uh, exophytic lesion mm -hmm. arising from uh, negative density, uh, uh, arising from the lower pole of the left kidney. Mm -hmm. uh, it is reaching up to the left eye left fossa uh, and also is in crossing midline. Uh, uh, it shows no evidence of calcification with it. Uh, uh, also, similar morphology lesion is seen arising from the lower pole of right kidney. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, so these are large exophytic bilateral renal lesions as you described them well. Okay, so they're primarily exophytic and they're mixed density. So you're seeing areas of low density here. That is the mean HUS 25, minus 25, sorry. And then there are a few soft tissue density areas within the lesion. Okay, it's kind of an exophytic lesion which is arising from the lower pole of the left kidney here is extremely large. And a similar morphology exophytic lesion is seen arising from the uh, lower pole of the right kidney with another kind of a cystic lesion here. Okay. Now let's go to the next. You know, what are these images and what are you seeing? Uh, these are the coronal and axial mm -hmm. lip images. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see uh, the lesion 
on the left side is mainly supplied by the branches of the left main renal artery uh, uh, a saccular outpouching is also seen on the superior aspect of the lesion mm -hmm. uh, likely uh, aneurysm Um, so this is the arterial phase right and uh, uh, as you said this is a so this uh, there are multiple vascular channels uh, seen here okay and uh, this is a saccular aneurysm you're right what are you what is this mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a blush there, okay? There is an arterial blush and again, there is a small aneurysm here, okay? So this lesion is actually showing heterogeneous enhancement with large multiple saccular aneurysms within the left renal lesion and an arterial blush was seen within the lesion, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, what are these images and what are you seeing? Uh -huh. Coronal and sagittal oh. Oh, images. Showing uh, um, a heterogeneous enhancement of the lesion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. uh, it is seen uh, like uh, it is uh, the lesion is related to the anterior abdominal wall anteriorly. Mm -hmm. It is seen uh, related to the sauce muscle posteriorly. Uh, uh, Okay, so basically the soft tissue components are uh, some components of the lesion are enhancing okay uh, significantly and uh, as uh, um, and here you can see the entire extent of the lesion arising from the lower pole of the left kidney here and this is the right kidney lower polar lesion okay. And uh, this is the delayed phase and uh, what are you seeing here. Uh uh, okay, so this is what is there in the pen? Are these filling uh, defects? Yes, ma'am. So, what do you think the uh, these would be? Because uh, the patient has aneurysms, the patient is uh, presented with hematuria, and uh, you're seeing arterial blush. Uh, it might be a clot. Yeah, so these may be clots because the patient was passing, had frank hematuria, even in the bladder, the patient had clots. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so what is the diagnosis? Uh, multiple bilateral renal angiomyelitomas with aneurysms. Yes. Okay. Aneurysms. Uh, okay, yeah. So bilateral renal angiomyelitomas with aneurysms in the left renal lower polar lesion. Okay, so why do you say the, this is angiomyelitoma? Um, fat density. Uh, it is a fat density lesion. Uh, okay, so it's uh, it's kind of a mixed dense. Like there are multiple components to the lesion, right? So you are seeing yes, yes. Uh, like few soft tissue density areas. There are few uh, fat density areas. My the HU was minus twenty five, and uh, these are enhancing. And there are these uh, uh, dilated vascular channels with areas of uh, with aneurysmal dilatations. Okay, so as the name suggests, angiomyolipomas. Okay, so there are these components of the lesions which you are appreciating on CT, and hence you are saying these is angiolipoma angiomyolipomas but uh, are all fat containing lesions in kidney angiomyolipomas which are the other fat containing lesions in kidney uh, renal cell carcinoma okay uh, it might contain fat sometimes uh, Yes, so RCCs may show fat sometimes, okay. Uh, renal oncocytomas may show. Uh, there are some liposarcomas which can arise near the capsule of the uh, kidney and uh, which can mimic a, a, a fat containing renal lesion, okay. So the main uh, concern is about RCC, okay. Yes, so uh, 
Or how do you differentiate a fat contained? Because as uh, we know, angiomyelopomas have three components and they may be present in different percentage. You know, they're like sometimes you have fat poor angiomyelopomas or sometimes uh, RCCs can show increased fat. So how do you uh, differentiate uh, or what are the features that would suggest an RCC over a, uh, over an angiomyelopoma? RCC, uh, uh, on, on Hanan's on an enhanced scan, it uh, has HU of around 20. On uh, contrast phase, it will show more than uh, 20 HU enhancement and show early washout. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, so angiomyelopoma is right, will show persistent enhancement Okay. Uh, 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 of the soft tissue components. I agree. And what else? So calcifications um, are more common in RCCs. Okay? RCC. So if you see macroscopic fat and if you see calcifications, then you are more concerned about RCCs than angiomyelopomas. But of course, not such kind of lesions. These are these are definitely large angiomyelopomas. And uh, but usually in smaller lesions, you are more concerned whether they are uh, you know smaller unilateral lesions containing macroscopic fat, that can be a diagnostic uh, concern. But uh, in such large uh, lesions, bilateral containing macroscopic fat, uh, that is not a uh, DD, okay? Uh, so now this patient, um, so yeah, okay. So now angiomyelopomas are benign lesions, which are mesenchymal neoplasms, as we spoke. They contain mature fat, smooth muscle, and thick walled blood vessels. And the amount of each component is variable, okay? And they're grouped under a family of tumors characterized by proliferation of perivascular epithelioid cells, that is PECO mass, okay? Uh, now, what are the... Now, uh, uh, is there any association of angiomyelopomas to any other pigmentosis syndromes or anything you know of? Uh, tuberous sclerosis. Okay. Uh, uh, so when do we say that you know, this may be tuberous sclerosis or do you suspect a tuberous sclerosis when you uh, pick up an angiomyelopoma? Uh, bi uh, mostly they are bilateral and young age group. Okay. Bilateral and multiple. Then you suspect a tuberous sclerosis. Tuberous sclerosis. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, um, what are the other stigmata of tuberous sclerosis that you will look for in the given scan? Um, or no, okay, not given scan. What will you look for? Do now this patient has a uh, bilateral uh, large angiomyelopomas, and uh, then you want to see whether this patient has tuberous sclerosis. So, what all will you look for in this patient? I'm uh, just asking you in short, what are the features of tuberous sclerosis? Brain, uh, in brain, we'll see for subependymal nodules. Uh, then sega, cortical tubers, uh, uh, and lung, we, we can see a lymphangial leomyomatosis, LAM, uh, cardiac rhabdomyomas. Okay. Anything else? Uh, uh, okay, so uh, as you said, depending on the uh, clinical symptoms, they will be evaluated further. Like with if they are uh, done an MRI brain, this patient, then you look for these things like cortical tubers, white matter changes, subependymal nodules, subependymal uh, uh, giant cell astrocytoma, that is SEGA. Okay, so that is in the brain. In uh, lung, as you said, lymphangioleomyomatosis. So what do you get in LAM? Uh, we see varying size cysts in the lung parenchyma with intervening normal lung parenchyma. So, so with intervening normal lung parenchyma. So whenever you get a CT of the abdomen with bilateral air, you have to even mention negative points that you're not seeing these things, okay? Because now you have bilateral AML and uh, so you will suspect a case of tuberous sclerosis, right? So, um, uh, what else uh, do you get in bones or anything? Uh, what, what do you get in bones? Um, so, you get sclerotic lesions in the bone, which may be seen in tuberous sclerosis. Okay, Cardiac, as you said, cardiac rhabdomyomas are common uh, 
uh, or is an uh, association of tuberous sclerosis. Okay, so how many do you have uh, an idea like uh, how how many percentages of AMLs are associated uh, with uh, tuberous sclerosis and how many are sporadic? Uh -huh. So usually 80% of AMLs are usually sporadic and 20% are associated with tuberous. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, as you said, bi multiple and bilateral uh, AMLs are usually associated with tuberous. Uh, uh, now, uh, just uh, an overall about uh, renal masses. Can you tell me what do you mean by a bean lesion or a ball lesion? Uh, ball type lesion will uh, destroy the reniform shape of the kidney and will in uh, displace the uh, adjacent structures while bean type uh, will be like infiltrating type that will preserve the reniform shape of the kidney ball type lesions are mainly rcc uh, aml bean type can be lymphomas uh, Okay, very good. Yeah, so as the name suggests, a ball type lesion will be like a, a ball in the kidney. Okay, so basically it will be a, a space occupying lesion which will distort the shape of the kidney, while a bean will uh, type of lesion will maintain the reniform shape of the kidney. Like uh, a ball type lesion, as I said, are RCCs, AMLs, oncocytomas, while uh, bean type are usually uh, PCCs or uh, uh, lymphomas, uh, infections, okay, they don't distort the shape of the kidney. Now, if there is, uh, now in this patient who presented with hemorrhage or it, like aneurysmal bleed, what as a radiologist can you do? Uh, coiling can be done, ma'am. Okay, embolization, yeah, okay. So embolization of the lesion can be done because the patient has presented with acute uh, hemorrhage or uh, within the lesion. So yes, you can do uh, embolization of the lesion. And last, uh, can you tell me something about what do you mean by renal nephrometry for renal masses? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, renal nephrometry score, uh, uh, the, we see for the parameters like radius, that is uh, size of the tumor. Uh, then whether it is exophytic endo or endophytic, then N stands for nearness to the collecting system, then A is whether it is anterior or posterior, and L, uh, L stands for location of tumor uh, in relation to polar regions or upper or lower pole. Uh, we grade accordingly. There are three points for each uh, oh. for size. Uh, if it is uh, less than four centimeter, it is 0.1, then two and uh, 0.2 is 4 to 7 centimeter, more than 7 centimeters, 0.3. Uh, exophytic, okay. uh, exophytic or endophytic, uh, if it is more than or equal to 50% exophytic, then less than or equal to 50% exophytic and completely endophytic lesion, then nearness uh, to the collecting system, uh, more than or equal to 7 mm is 0.1, 4 to 7 mm is 0.2 and less than 4 mm is 0.3. Then uh, anterior posterior location and nearness to the polar region. Okay, the end of uh, yeah, the polar line. So basically, uh, what are you assessing with this? Like, if you if the patient has a high uh, nephrometry score, like you know, a high complexity, then what are you saying? So what uh, does it imply? Operability of uh, operability. Yeah, so how complex um, will be uh, the surgical approach to this case? Okay, so um, like if it is closer to the collecting system or whether it is completely endophytic or it is crossing the polar line, then the surgery becomes more complicated and hence a nephrometry score is assessed. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, fine. Thank you so much, uh, Saili and Anuja. And uh, we end um, our case discussion here. Thank you so much, Dr. Sneha. Those cases were very nice. I mean, all were very exam oriented, very to the point and pertinent exactly what uh, a student should be knowing. Dr. Venu, sir, you would like to comment? I didn't see before. Uh, madam, is there a problem?
uh, really it was a really uh, exam oriented session because each points were covered uh, infections tumors uh, bladder mass and prostate i was really very happy to see and the students were also answering very nicely thank you uh, it was really uh, wonderful the, the i can see the teacher in you the how you teach them <laughs> it was really really wonderful and the cases also were beautiful thank you so much ma'am thank you very much okay then okay. doctor students yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, as madam said now all the cases are actually very typical and the <clears throat> exam cases uh, and uh, the residents you know they performed well uh, are there final final residents or just i would like to know dr <laughs> anulya and all final year residents yes, second year second year okay, okay very good because the second year no no having <laughs> this much uh, knowledge now that is very good and anyway, we keep it up and uh, dr anjana said the first case no you said paper thinning of the renal cortex actually that is a good yes. terminology no paper thinning so yes. usually we describe like uh, it is more whether it is more than 10 mm or less than 10 mm and no so when you say less than 10 mm so that is actually paper thin so yes. when it is less than 10 mm actually that point may not be uh, conveyed properly no but one <clears throat> suppose if you say paper thin then immediately the listener will understand that the kidney is so much uh, is very much thinned out very gross hydronephrosis so yes. that uh, message the listener will get now so that is a good, uh, uh, good, good terminology that anybody can use it paper paper thinning of the renal cortex paper thinning of the renal cortex now and another thing in the first case you said i mean second case now bladder mass you said the yes. lesion is close to the bladder neck am i right yes sir. bladder neck that uh, but bladder neck is actually is in the trigone area what i feel the lesion is uh, here actually we are seeing the lesion close to the vesico ureteric junction yes, sir. okay so it is not at the bladder neck am i right if it yes, is sir. not at the bladder neck yes Yes, sir. It's not at the bladder neck. It was near the vesico ureteric junction. It is at the vesico ureteric junction. That is at the base of the, not at the. Sorry, at the base of the trigon. At the yeah. base of the trigon. Yes. Okay. Base. Uh, that is only. And uh, yeah, that is only. then then uh, regarding the fat containing tumors of kidney, you know, um, the commonest one is actually the angiomyelopoma, and then ra rarely you can get lipoma. That also we discussed, and then renal cell carcinoma. Okay. so not many will um, uh, think about that renal cell carcinoma can have fat but it's very rare so far actually i haven't seen any case with a fat inset but it has been described in liter literature but another thing that you can tell is re renal teratoma renal teratoma is also there even though it is very rare but that contains fat so these things you can mention about and then what about uh, okay uh, that's all then one um, genuine doubt now and before that one somebody asked what is the difference between synchronous and metachronous um, regarding urothelial tumors now so uh, uh, the synchronous tumors suppose you, there is a lesion there and at the same time you are seeing another lesion we can say that this is a synchronous lesion at the same time but suppose <clears throat> the lesion is seen after a particular time for example 6 months then you can say that it is a metachronous lesion at the time of the initial lesion the other lesion is not there after a certain period the second lesion develops in that case it is a metachronous lesion somebody asked i think in the chat box so that's all and then one doubt that i am having is so when there is enhanced so basic doubt now um, um when you say enhancement is it in homogeneous enhancement or is it heterogeneous enhancement which is right and this is left to you <laughs> for discuss <laughs> afterwards in homogeneous enhancement and heterogeneous enhancement when when you can say heterogeneous when you can say in homogeneous so whether they are the same or different or in what context you can use these terms okay thank you very much thank you thank you dr sneha thank you thank you sir. very good cases and uh, yeah
Uh, as Madam said, you are a good teacher. No, there was a question in the chat box, Avani. There are a few questions. I was just waiting for Venus yeah. to finish. So yeah. I was bringing out such nice points. So again, something subtle which we have missed out, and in the discussion we haven't noticed. Uh, Venus yeah, was yeah. bringing them out. So uh, there were a few more questions. One thing, sir, already mentioned, Dr. Sneha, synchronous and metachronous. Then there was a question: Can we label sclerotic myths on these images? I don't know what that meant. But we already discussed that it was sclerotic meds. So then the next question is, do we have to use both diffusion-weighted imaging and T2? Uh, Dr. Avani, what was the, what was the uh, question? Can we label sclerotic meds on these images? I think maybe they may, meant it on the films. I'm not sure if that's what they meant. That is in CT, you mean? Uh, yes, so there was no, there was an MRI image in which she had discussed a prostatic, oh, extra oh, prostatic malignancy. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 so yeah, I think yeah. maybe they meant whether it can be labeled in the films. I'm not sure what it meant. So do we have to use both diffusion weighted imaging and T2 for scoring if prostatic lesion is extending into both zones? Uh, yes, uh, it, it has to be because uh, uh, basically diffusion and T2 both have to be used together along with DC MRI when such lesions are DC basically is used for peripheral zone to dif uh, differentiate uh, pyrax 3 and 4 but otherwise when uh, the entire prostate is involved then yeah you have to use and most of the times if both the zones are involved the lesion is pretty large I mean, if you're saying that both transition, the lesion is involving the transitional zone as well as the peripheral zone, then uh, it no, it won't be really doubtful whether the lesion is a malignancy or not. You know, it will be more than 1.5 centimeter for sure if it is involving both the lobes. I mean, both the zones. Then uh, the doubt will be less when the lesions are small and only involving a particular zone that you know, peripheral zone or a transitional zone. Then you have to look at the dominant sequ uh, sequence. If there is a large lesions like in our case or, you know, like more than 1.5 centimeter, the lesion is large, then uh, uh, yes, T2, uh, you have to have hypo intensity and the diffusion has to be restricted to call it a malignant lesion. Again, in the similar lines, I had a doubt because we had a case recently where uh, you are seeing a significant ADC drop. You are seeing a T2, that charcoal gray, uh, fine, yeah, the hypo yes. intensity, everything is there. The lesion is small, but I am seeing sclerotic metastasis. Mm. So uh, at that point, and that patient was a CKD patient. Okay. So the question was whether we should go ahead with this. So uh, at that time, uh, yes, yes. is there any better way of doing? PSA was not very high actually for that patient. That was again a decisive point. So again, um, if at that point, I suggested that we go ahead, you go ahead and do a targeted biopsy in the zone. So is there some other way it should have been dealt with? Uh, no, if uh, so, the lesion was in the peripheral zone. It was in the peripheral zone, but from what I remember, it was around nine millimeters or eight millimeters or something. Okay, okay. But it was having ADC. It was significantly oh. hyper intense. Diffusion weighted high. B value okay. it was hyper intense, and okay. it ha had sclerotic meds already. Okay. No. So basically, uh, the the contribution of DC MRI is when it is the score is three. Like the diffusion score is three, and you have to decide whether it you have to put it in pyrax three or four. Now, if it the lesion is in the peripheral zone and the already the diffusion score you're saying that was high, right? Like the pyra the according to the grading must be four or five, then uh must be four, like not five because the lesion is nine millimeter, you, uh, you said. Five so then uh, uh, it will go in pyrax four, and uh, the directly you need to biopsy the lesion because since the patient is CKD patient. Otherwise, we usually complete the study. But uh, uh, if it's a CKD patient, peripheral zone lesion, diffusion is restricted with a significant ADC drop, then you can directly go ahead with a targeted. Uh, actually, we do a 12-core uh, biopsy because sometimes uh, uh, like a trust-guided 12-core biopsy um, because sometimes, uh, you know, small uh, lesions may not be, there are few uh, zones which may not be picked up so it's always better to do a 12 core uh, trust guided biopsy for these uh, patients to pick up clinically significant uh, most of the times clinically significant uh, uh, prostate cancer is picked up on mri but uh, we still advocate 12 core trust guided biopsy rather than a, a are you still are you doing a targeted biopsy for prostate no, normally, I mean, if it's a blinded biopsy, we're looking for something. Normally, what's being followed here is a sextant biopsy. Six, you got a six four. Four. Okay. But the thing
thing is, uh, I, that, I was, that was going to be my next question. When you know exactly where you're targeting, this is the area of suspicion that we are having, hmm. then do you still, still, you would advocate going for a 12 core biopsy or? Uh... Uh, actually, uh, see, um, uh, yeah, usually we, that is the protocol. I mean, we go ahead with a, a 12 core biopsy. Many a times what happens is like, if you're still getting negative biopsies, and you have got an MRI and then on that you have seen a lesion where see many areas like you know uh, if the lesion is near the anterior fibromuscular stroma or it is very near uh, to the capsule where uh, the routine sex and biopsy has not targeted it properly then the second biopsies usually are done after seeing the MRI and then you target the lesion and then you know take only from that area. Otherwise, most of the times, uh, it is either a sex stand or a 12th core biopsy. Depending on the actually institute, because where I worked in, uh, I was working in Tata uh, Hospital and there we used to do a 12th core biopsy. Yeah, this uh, next thing is any tips to remember the TNM staging for all cancers? <laughs> no. It's difficult. <laughs> I used to have these uh, picture images. You have all these uh, nice, uh, very graphical images now. So I, make, I used to mug up for my exams. And right before going, I'll look at those images. Yes. You know, it gets that picture memory stays in your head. Yes. So there okay. are few cancers where you are expected to know the staging. You are not yes, expected to know staging for all the cancers for the your exam. Like, uh, uh, like uh, renal cell carcinoma, bladder um, uh, lung, uh, these things uh, you are expected to know the TNM staging. So, Maybe even cervix, cervix, yeah. Cervix all these are uh, uh, there are few cancers you should know where you know the examiner might ask you the TNM <laughs> staging. So, these are the uh, few, uh, even uterus, you know, you where you know whether the inner half or the outer half of the myometrium is involved. So, all these where the Im imaging plays such an important, I think, uh, these. And you should at least know that what is your role there, you know, what they are looking at. So that is important. Uh, so then next one is uh, Dixon MR imaging helps in differentiating AML and clear cell carcinoma. It's a question. Does it help in differentiating AML and a clear cell carcinoma? Uh, you mean uh, Dixon, that is the four, uh, uh, the fat sat and the in phase opposite phase images, right? I think there are two sequences, no? Venus of a Dixon, one, ma'am. Uh, I think one is the the one is the in phase and out phase. Yeah, and then and I fat think there is one pre contrast that thin Dixon hmm. sequences are done. That's also yeah, Dixon. So we sequence. get four sequences in Dixon in our uh, setup. One is in phase, opposite phase, and fat only and water only sequence. So uh, yes, so basically uh, AML, the if you have macroscopic fat, usually. Uh, such large lesions again it's like uh, where picking up macroscopic fat becomes easier in opposed phased images we take either like uh, fat set and opposed phase images so if it's a uh, suppressed on fat set images then you don't need to worry but some uh, very small areas may not be picked up on uh, ct because of partial voluming so for those cases it has been advocated that you do opposed phase images where you get India ink artifact at the border of fat and the other soft tissue component. That is what they have said. But now I think with these high resolution CT images, I think uh, we usually pick up the fat well. If at all small areas, then maybe we can go ahead with Dixon opposed in on opposed phase images. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Venu sir, Gomati ma'am, you want to add something to this? Yeah, yeah, no, no more questions. Just brilliantly. <laughs> uh, Dr. It was wonderful, Dr. Sneha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The, I'm sure the students would find it very. You can yeah, understand yeah, by the questions and, also. Yes, a lot exactly. of participants. Uh, further gets circulated also. Whatever is being done now gets recorded and gets circulated for the students' benefit in the future also. So even Dr. Anuja and Dr. Sayali, they have got the hot seat experience also and they have actually helped in you know, being part of uh, the educational process for so many people. So that's, uh, there's another thing. Can you please list important cancers for which we need to learn the staging map? 
<laughs> okay <laughs> that's what uh, we just uh, discussed i think uh, lung uh, is important renal are uh, like the rcc uh, staging will be important cervix bladder um uh i mm, endometrium yeah endometrium endometrium, endometrium ovary see. i think I'm just writing it down so that the patient doesn't yeah. come again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can you just can, send it in the chat. You can so. message it. Yeah. yeah send it. All the students should know about the lung carcinoma staging, yeah. renal cell carcinoma, bladder staging. They should know the TNM. That's very important because when we give the report, the oncologist requires of staging when we give the CT report. Yes. And even MRI for CA cervix, CA rectum, all these new require staging. Yes. Yes, rectum also it is important. The MRI, yeah. rectum. Yeah. So rectal patient. Yeah, fine. So I have sent the list over to whoever wants because a couple of them have asked the same question. Yeah. So send the list in the chat. So hopefully uh, it is this particular part uh, should be clear for everyone. And I don't think there's any easy way to go for it. You have to learn it have by heart. Learn, Unfortunately, yeah. when we practice, we always tend to, with practice, like Venu Sir and all is seeing it out day in and day out. They wouldn't need any references. But uh, when it comes to us, I think uh, we do refer and there's nothing yeah. wrong yes. in referring. But as yeah, a student, yeah. you can't refer. As a student, yeah, yeah. you have to learn <laughs> <Yes>. it. <laughs> so uh, you just have to learn it. I guess there's no easy way out of it. And uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Sneha. Thank you to so much, Dr. Anuja, Dr. Sayali. And uh, uh, thank you so much, Gomiti, ma'am. Uh, you, uh, you have been like spearheading the entire project throughout. Thank you so much, Dr. Venu, sir. Uh, he's been guiding us throughout the entire thing. Dr. Ramesh, sir, he's always behind the screen, but always there with us. And again, uh, Dr. Sneha and her students, Dr. Anuja and Dr. Sayali. And thank you so much, the Kerala IRA, always for promoting so much of academics and giving so much of importance to all of it. We have had so many sessions. We are having it weekly. And a lot of academic coordinators are involved. So I thank all the academic coordinators also for this. And I thank the uh, MedPiper team for providing us such a wonderful platform. And most importantly, thank you to the, or to the audience because they have been listening to it, making the most of it, and hopefully gaining a lot of, lot of knowledge.